Hello and um, welcome everyone to a, another lovely Saturday webinar. Um, hope it is not as hot where you are as it is where I am. Um, there's a little bit much for my tastes. Um, but um, we'd be looking ahead to the cooler months in prospect, um, particularly to the middle of October, because we're going to be talking today about personal statements. Um, and looking at eight, um, I've actually cheated because there are nine um, different things to look at in terms of putting together a really memorable, really effective personal statement. Um, next week, we're going to be talking about extracurricular activities. Um, which is going to be an interesting one. Um, and this week, I'm joined by my colleague, Sophie. Say hello, Sophie. Hello, everybody. Hi, Matt. How are you? I'm all right. Very hot. A um, bit too hot. Down in, <laughs> yes, down in Bournemouth, it's very hot. I believe you're a Brighton sort of way? I'm in Brighton, yeah, right by the sea, which is also very hot. <laughs> but I'm not complaining because... It's just nice. Like, you know, we can't, we can't It's in, enjoy it while it's here. It'll be gone oh, and then we'll, I, we'll be complaining about it being cold next. <laughs> I, I am complaining. It is uh, 28 <laughs> in, my, in, my, in my office. Um, uh, so you, will, you, you can all be very grateful that I put on a shirt because this is the only uh, time I intend to wear one today. Um, <laughs> as I mentioned, we'll be talking today about personal statements. Um, and of course, the first question that I think comes to everyone's mind when thinking about the personal statement is uh, why? Um, because, you know, given the choice, perhaps you wouldn't, you'd rather not do it. Um, so the thing to say here is personal statements have been around for about 30 years now. Um, prior to this, the system was not coordinated in any particular sort of way. There were different pathways for different universities. It wasn't a an all put together kind of system. Um, and that changed in the 90s when UCAS came along um, and the personal statement was introduced to help the universities choose um, which students they wanted when the information they were getting from GCSEs, from A-levels, um, wasn't giving them enough to make that decision. Um, so the personal statement was a chance for you, the applicant, to show why you wanted to study this topic, um, really put yourself forward um, to make that application process a little bit more sophisticated than just making it about tests or numbers. Um, so, probably you're thinking, well, that's all lovely historical context, but I don't really care. Um, you're wondering about why it is they're so hard to write. Um, the first reason for this is you probably haven't done anything like it before. I know some schools will have students practice doing them at earlier stages in their um, academic careers. But generally speaking, um, you don't normally write about yourself. You might write about Shakespeare, you might write about um, Stalin, you might write about sodium, we're, we're sticking with the letter S, um, but you probably don't write about yourself very often. And that makes it quite an uncomfortable experience. It can be difficult to really think about oneself, say, well, I'm good at this, I'm bad at that. I can't, ugh. It's not nice. It makes you feel uncomfortable. Um, and things are made harder by the fact that you really don't have that much space to work with. Um, you've only got those 47 lines, 4,000 characters. It feels like at, the, at once not enough space and also far too much space. Um, the other thing here is that you can't just come out and say it. If you were allowed to just write in your personal statement, I would like to go to Oxford uh, because I am very clever. Um, thank you. That would be really easy, but the problem is you can't just do that because they'll read that and they'll go, well, how do we know he's clever? I mean, he says he is, but what if he's lying? So what you've got to do is you've got to make a kind of argument for why you are so clever and interesting and worthwhile working with, but you can't just say that. Um, you have to show it without saying it, and it's it's a difficult kind of argument to make. Um, I mentioned the 4,000 characters. We tend to think of this um, here at EU Admissions in kind of four parts, which is the structure I'm going to be following today. Um, so we're going to have nine parts and also four parts. It's going to be it's going to be very numerology if you're into numerology. Um, but I just wanted to sort of flag up, this is kind of the structure we're going to be thinking through. Um, 
one of the other ways I like to think of the personal statement is to try and come up with a little bit of a metaphor. So what I what I tend to suggest to students is a it's a little bit like trying to write poetry, um, a sonnet in particular. Don't make that comparison in your personal statement. People are always doing it. It's, it's a bit old hat. Um, but, you know, you've only got so much space. That's the kind of thing you would expect from a poem. You've got to hit all of these certain ideas and topics. So there are there are certain things you feel you need to talk about, just as in a sonnet, you would have to talk about love, even if you didn't want to. Um, there are lots of things that come back in personal statements. I have read hundreds, possibly even a thousand personal statement statements over the, God, 10 years I've been doing this. And there are certain books, certain ideas, certain things that come back again and again and again to the point where you see it and you go, oh, this one again, really? This is the 17th time I've seen someone talk about this one book. Um, and so you want to watch out for that. That makes it challenging. Um, and of course, like poetry, it's harder to write than it looks. You might think it's easier to write a poem, um, but I can tell you it's it's harder than it looks to, to do one. Um, didn't didn't turn out to be a successful career for me. Um, I did do, um, actually, for, I think it was for a year ago, I did actually do a personal statement poem. Uh, which I haven't included in the presentation today, um, but um, perhaps that's one we'll come back to later in the year. I, I was very pleased with it at the time, but I haven't looked, so it might actually be rubbish. Bit of a worry. Um, so that's step zero. Um, why do I have to write a personal statement? Um, moving on to step one, the first step is going to be the opening line of your personal statement. Um, here are some of the most popular opening lines that I've seen. As you might expect, these are all very cliched. Um, you might start personal statement saying, from a young age, I've always been interested in, or from an early age, or for as long as I can remember. Or oh, I've been interested in this, I've been fascinated. Oh, well, that's, that's, that's not very interesting. Um, so you've been interested in it forever. Oh, okay. You know, what is this? What is this sentence telling me? It's telling me you are interested in medicine. Well, that's great, but I knew that because you're applying to study medicine, but you've been interested in it forever. Really? Okay. Nothing interesting happened to you. You didn't um, have experience, see something happen, learn something, nothing inspired, you know, forever. Um, it's a difficult way to start. Another thing, uh, another mistake people make is to start out with a really long, difficult sentence trying to explain their motivation. Um, this one is particularly interesting. Um, the, the student writes, for me, medicine offers an academically and mentally challenging profession which amalgamates my fascination with the human body and my desire to work with a variety of individuals with their own problems on a day-to-day -day basis. <gasps> We should put a, hit there, put a comma in there. It offers a chance to make a real difference to the lives of others. Now, there are a few things wrong with this. Uh, first of all, that's not what amalgamates means. Uh, amalgamating is when you make an alloy. Um, it's the simplest way of thinking about it. So it would be very strange for you to alloy a profession with problems. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't really make conceptual sense. You've started with, for me, for who else? For my mum? For the Queen? No. Obviously for you. It's a personal statement. You don't need to say that it's for you. Um, so for me, isn't adding anything there. You're also telling me what medicine is. Like, I know what medicine is. It's fine. You don't need to tell me. And I haven't learned anything about you in this very long sentence. You told me you're interested in the body, and you like other people, and you like solving problems, and that medicine is difficult. None of these things are very interesting. They're all things I knew. You've got way too many ideas in here. You haven't developed any of them. It's it's a mess. Um, it's also a really, really long sentence. Um, don't, don't ever write a sentence that you can't read out in one breath. Um, that is at least two sentences, that first sentence. Um, so I would say, if you're thinking about your opening line, don't don't start off don't start off like this. Think about coming up with something that is personal, something that is short, and something that isn't going to state things about the subject that you're applying for. The person reading already knows because they already know that. 
they want to find out about you and if you're not telling them things about you you're not you're not using your your space to the best effect that takes on to step two stating the obvious which i think we've touched a little bit there um this is a classic of when students are beginning to draft their personal statements and sometimes because they're um perfectly okay sentences they tend to stick around for longer than they should so you might have a sentence like as part of my a-level studies or maths has given me this english has given me that and spanish has given me a third thing or um my personal favorite I like the multidisciplinary aspect of the course. If you're applying for a subject with and in it, you're applying for economics and management and you say, I like the way that it has economics and management. And again, they know that. You don't, you don't, don't, don't state the obvious. It's already on the UCAS form, what your A-levels are. So you don't need to tell me again, um, whether that's your IB, whatever exam system you're following, it's already in the form. You don't need to tell me again here. I also know, me, the reader, what maths is. I know what English is. Yo conozco que es la lengua español. I know this stuff. You don't need to tell me. If you tell me maths has given me uh, reasoning abilities, I'll go, yes, it does that. If you go, oh, I've learned critical thinking from English, I'll go, yes. You know, the worst you can th thing you can do here is you can go, I've all, I would love to study history because I'm interested in the past. Don't do, don't do that. The person reading already knows these things. You're wasting space and you're not showing that you're an interesting, passionate person. You're showing them that you know what maths is, which I mean, great, but it's not that impressive. Um, Similar to this is the rhetorical question. You might begin your personal statement by saying, you may be thinking to yourself at this moment, why medicine? Well, no, that isn't the question I'm thinking of. I'm thinking, why you? Why should I invite to an interview the person who wrote this personal statement? I'm not thinking about why medicine. So you've, you've already confused me by telling me what I'm thinking and you've got it wrong. Um, and then you've said, ah, oh, from an early age, oh, no, oh God, two, two unhelpful pieces of information. Um, and you've then told me that the human body is more interesting than a computer, which could be the beginning of an interesting personal statement. So start there. Start with the human body is more complex and interesting than a computer. Don't start with, I know what you're thinking. No, not that. Also, ever since I was a child, I've been fascinated by the body and the computer. No, just start with the idea that you're actually starting with. Um, this all goes to and this sort of the sort of sum up point. You've got to remember your audience. They already know what subject you're applying to. It's on the form. They also know a lot more about the subject than you do. Um, that's why you want to go to university. You want to learn. If you write the personal statement in such a way that suggests you already know it all, they will think, oh, well, that's fine then. We don't need to let this person come to the university. They already know everything. What would be the point? They can apply for a job here if they like, but this guy, he already knows everything. Why would we, why would we give him a place? No, 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 we, we'll, we won't go for him. We'll go for one of the people who actually wants to learn something. So don't, don't patronize your audience. Don't tell them what medicine is. Don't tell them that you've been fascinated by medicine since you were a fetus because it's not true. Um, don't ask weird rhetorical questions. Um, try and be be honest and curious and open. Don't, like I say, don't state the obvious. Don't waste two sentences of your personal statement defining the subject you're applying for. They already know what you're applying for. They already know what history is. Um, and they probably know it better than you. So the chances of you coming up with an answer that's going to impress them, pretty slim. So that takes us on to our next part, uh, part three, which is the fourth part. I mean, come with the new numbers today. Um, we're going to talk about your first example. Um, this is the beginning of the, sort of the main body of your personal statement. So we've got through the introduction and we're heading into the main section of, of proper content. Um, the person who is reading the personal statement, they now know why you're here. You have said to them, 
I want to study uh, law because I hate criminals. Um, and now you're going to explain to me what it is about criminals that really upsets you. Um, and hopefully you're going to do this by talking about um, maybe some abstract ideas about where the law comes from, um, a set of ideas about how crime can harm people and how it is bad. You might talk about different legal precedents. You might talk about um, uh, famous works of fiction. You might talk about crime and punishment. You might talk about Macbeth. You might talk about um, the experience you had going to a trial. Um, you can kind of choose whatever you want for your first example, but it needs to explain why you are interested in the subject. It needs to show the journey of your interest um, growing and deepening, and it needs to show that you've put some effort in. Um, you can't just go really quickly over something. You need to show that you've spent time and depth, because if you're applying to study, you know, let's stick with law here, you're going to be studying a lot of law. You're going to be there, you know, 35, 40, 50 hours a week studying law. And so if I'm going to agree to let you come and do that, I'm going to want some evidence that you're actually going to do it, that you actually care about it, that you actually enjoy it. And so if what you give me is, eh, I watch Law and Order sometimes, I'm going to think, you're going to enjoy this, you're going to be rubbish at this. Because even, even in the personal statement, when you've been given one page to impress me, you're not even really trying. So you want to you want to show that you've actually done the reading. Um, so here is um, an example sticking with law. Um, this isn't one I like. Um, so the uh, the applicant writes: reading the book Eve was framed by Helena Kennedy has also been fascinating, as I have started to think about issues which I had never before considered: how law might be affected by gender. Since watching two documentaries about jails in Miami, Florida. I've also become interested in the differences between the British and American legal systems. So let's take this sort of slowly. Now, the first thing to say is, and you probably won't know this because this is something you would only know if you had read thousands of personal statements. Everyone has read Eve Was Framed. It is like the most obvious book in the world. So it's great that you've read it, but I wouldn't put it in your personal statement. I would put in the personal statement the book you read after Eve Was Framed. Not this one. It's it's very much the first book you would read. You want to show that you've developed your understanding further. You've also, um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna hazard a guess that a boy wrote this statement. Um, you've also showed that you're perhaps not the world's most reflective person, because aged seventeen, discovering that sexism might exist is a little embarrassing. Um, I probably wouldn't admit that in my personal statement. I would pretend I had known that before I was 17. Um, but that's not the, the biggest point. The, the problem here is that we've given this book one sentence. Now, it's a pretty good book. Everyone reads it for a reason, right? One sentence. That's not enough. If you're going to be interested in an idea like law and gender, people spend entire careers tackling that. That is a huge topic of potentially infinite complexity. One sentence. You then, and this is something that particularly annoys me with law statements, you've become distracted by America. This happens a lot. It's super annoying. You've watched a documentary about how prison is bad. Great. And you've become distracted, and now you're interested in American law, which is a totally different subject from English law, which you're not applying to study, and really isn't relevant here. Like, it's great that you're interested in comparative legal systems, but if you're going to talk about that, I want more detail than going, in America, they have a lot of guns and they do a lot of prison. And your one sentence here, it, it's not telling me that you're going to give me the kind of interesting legal detail I'm interested in. All I'm getting here is you read a book, not very thoroughly, and you watched two documentaries. So what I'm seeing here is maybe a day of work and that that doesn't say to me that you're really motivated by the subject because you used up a whole personal chunk of your personal statement on one day's worth of reading and watching something on netflix i'm not i'm not sold on your motivation based on that um here are some other ways you can be caught out with your examples have you used an, an a-level text 
for your exa- your first example in your personal statement. The people reading the personal statements know what's on the A levels. If the only book that you've read on the subject, book you had to read for A level English anyway, that says to me, ah, oh, this guy's not all that into reading. Uh, because it appears they've only read the book that's supposed to. So careful with that one. If you have something really interesting to say about, well, I don't know what's on the A-level English curriculum this year. I'm going to guess it's far from the madding crowd again, um, and possibly death of a salesman. Uh, maybe this is out of date. Maybe that's what it was like in the in the in the two thousands. Um, but yeah, you don't want to be going for the stuff that is just on the A-level syllabus. It's a little too obvious. People are going to notice you haven't done very much reading. Have you chosen the most obvious book? Have you ty- typed in law personal statement book? Because that will definitely return for you. Eve was framed. Again, good book, but that's the first book you read, maybe the second book. You should be getting to a point where you have read 10, 11, 12 books, and you're telling me a book about books 7, 11, and 9, so that what I'm noticing is that you have pursued the subject, you've gone into depth, you have followed up on ideas, not that you've read one book, because when you get to university, you're going to find that reading one book is not enough, and you're not going to enjoy it if that's your your approach. Um, as I said, you want to be showing that you are reading deeply, or that you're reading widely. Maybe you go for a bunch of different books from different time periods, from different ideas, but you want to be showing breadth or depth, or ideally both. What you don't want to show off is that you've read one book. Um, because that is, it's not, the, it's not the kind of approach to academia that's going to endear you to the reader. Now, we've talked a little bit about engaging with the text. That's what I'm going to go into now. We'll talk about exploring the text. Um, think about the way you're going to approach the text you've chosen. What do you think about, um, and we're going to look at something sort of political here in this example. What do you think about Plato's Republic? You read it? What did it make you think? Um, what questions did it pose to you? Um, how was it different from other things you've read? Because remember, you should have read at least two books. How is it different from something newer? How is it different from something else that's really old? Um, how did it contrast with the ideas that you had um, kind of taken for granted or been brought up with? You know, chances are that um, being a part of the English speaking world, you had taken the ideas of elections and democracy kind of for granted. What did Plato's Republic make you think about those things? Did it make you question them? Did it make you feel more, uh, more invested in them? These are the kind of things you want to be asking yourself. Another question, and this is more relevant if you're thinking about history and English and things that are um, in the humanities, is why, is why is the text that you've been reading the way it is? Um, and this goes for um, social sciences as well. If you've been reading, for example, um, the man who mistook his wife for a hat. You know, why has Sachs chosen to write the book that way? Why is it kind of a little bit fun and silly? Why does it have a funny title? Um, if you're reading Plato again, why is it in this format where people are having a conversation? Why doesn't he just tell you what he thinks? Why does he keep asking, why does Socrates keep asking questions? Why does he keep making these weird comparisons where he says that it's like a boat? Um, these are the kinds of things you want to be exploring. Um, and the, the message you want to be sending is, I read this book, it was really interesting, and it made me want to do the subject that I've chosen even more. It made me realize that I'd made the right decision, and you can tell because I'm asking smart questions about it, I've been really thinking about it, I've engaged with the text. We can look at a good example. Um, so, a uh, student applying for, I believe this was for PPE, writes, Many of Plato's proposed solutions to these flaws undermine what are today viewed as personal rights. This led me to reflect on how laws protect us, also how their intricacies create a doctrine to which people adhere, both complying and incorporating it into their own morality. Investigating Plato's ideal political system, I considered the contrast between how his laws were devised and their status in our own society. Plato's guardians, not unlike our own judiciary, relied on to both codify and interpret the law. While their decisions were considered to be benevolent, society was expected to conform to laws dictated by a separate class. Now, what you'll notice here is number one, they've read the book. Um, you'd be surprised how many people don't. Um, they have reflected, they have drawn out some ideas and themes, they have compared it with the present day, they've done that twice. 
and they've compared it both with how people at the kind of ground level are doing with things up in this first paragraph, but also how this is reflected in broader social structures. This is really good. It shows that you've read the book, it shows that you were interested in its ideas, and it shows that it's made you think again about the way that people live now, about the assumptions that you were taken into um, thinking about politics. It's a good answer. Um, but more to it than that, because unfortunately, you're going to have to be interested in something else. You probably can't get away with just one book, even if you've really, really read it. Um, you're going to need a second idea for your personal statement. You may even want three. You're going to want another example. So what else is interesting to you about the course? Hopefully there's more than one thing. Um, if you're only interested in one little bit of it, that is fine. But ideally, you want to be able to transition somewhere in the middle of your statement into a second set of things that you're interested in. It means you don't spend too long on one thing. It means you can show a little bit of variety and it allows you to show development in your thought. It's good to be interested in more than one thing. And it's a great chance to show the way that you've read more than one book. So what you want to do here, and we're about, I would say, two thirds of the way through this statement now, you want to swap into another theme of your reading and research. Um, ideally, you want it to be something related. So you can do a lovely smooth transition, but it's not the end of the world if you can't. Um, Let's have a look at an example. Um, so here we are looking at a uh, another law example. And this person writes, by treating the use of drugs as a health issue rather than a criminal one, we can grant individuals the assistance they need in order to become productive members of society. Undertaking this project developed my ability to study independently and bring rigor to my thought process. Another experience that solidified my determination to study law was my work in stem cell research. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm confused because we've had this interesting discussion of drug policy, and this is a good personal statement, by the way, but we haven't been able to transition very smoothly. You can see here where the join is, right? They've gone, and it brought me to my thought process. End of page. New idea. Here is another experience. It also solidified my determination. <sighs> now, I'm not sure you can solidify determination. Um, anyway but what's happened here is you've, you've tried to do this nice transition but you're changing too many things at once we're now in stem cell research rather than drugs we're now uh, with solidifying determination as the link it, it doesn't go across there's probably a smoother way of doing this and of introducing this new theme um you could have talked about um for example, the biological components of um, addiction and how that is tied to a kind of unfairness. You know, some people might have a chemical disposition to be more uh, prone to addiction. And so something like that one a little bit tidier. What you want to do when you're coming into your second idea is you want to make a nice smooth transition so that you can show that the ideas you're interested in are linked up because you want to show that you're interested in all the different parts of the course that you're applying for. You want to show how you fit together, how the course fits together, how your ideas fit together. Doing it this way, where it's a little clunky, isn't the end of the world. Um, I still think this is a pretty good statement. Um, but what I would have wanted to do here is, this feels like a middle draft. What you've done is you've just started a new paragraph, new idea, and you want to come back later and figure out, maybe save yourself um, a, little bit of, a little bit of space in the statement. Uh, so that you can figure out how to do a nice a nice clean transition rather than sort of stopping and starting as you have down here but like i said it's still pretty good um the other thing to talk about here um, and then we're going to come on to this on the next slide is about respecting the texts that you're working with um, this is one of the biggest mistakes i see in personal statements we talked about plato's republic a few moments ago now that was written something like two and a half thousand years ago 2,300 maybe, um, a pretty long time ago. Um, and people have been reading it ever since. Um, oh, I've double checked and the answer is 2,397 years. So I was pretty close. Um, in two and a half thousand years, are people gonna be reading your personal statement? No, no, they're not, are they? They're probably not gonna be reading it in one year. Um, in fact, when I was at Cambridge, one of the tutors would do a dinner 
um, at the end of final year, where he would have students read out their personal statements um, as part of a very embarrassing ritual, because even three years on, people found it unbearable to read what they had written. Um, and that's only three years. We're talking 800 times three here. Um, so you want to really respect these books. The texts that you're talking about, these are part of a, hopefully, if you picked good ones, they're part of a rich intellectual tradition. They are so much bigger deal than you are ever going to be. You could achieve whatever you want in philosophy, but you're not going to beat Plato. He had the unfair advantage of being there at the beginning, but you're still not going to do it. And so treating these texts with respect is really important. There will be people at the university who are spending their whole careers studying perhaps even one aspect of Plato. You dismissing Plato in three sentences, it's, it's not going to sit well with them. Again, this is about remembering that you are applying to the university to learn, not to teach. If you're too smart for the university, they will agree and go, oh, well, this kid, he's too smart. He doesn't need to come. Fine. And they'll give the place to someone who's more interested in learning. So as an example of this, and this gets to another point as well, this person, I've done a lot of law examples. I'm sorry about that. I find that they're the easiest ones to do, um, probably because lawyers are normally bad writers. Um, to satisfy my curiosity in law, they write, I initially read What About Law, which introduced me to several legal areas, specifically attracting me to the law of contract. Reading Alan Hutchinson, is eating people wrong and is killing people right intensified my desire to study law as they've been discussed a variety of legal milestones from British and American history. Likewise, Tom Bigham's The Rule of Law highlighted the sheer importance of law in a democratic society. Whilst HIA Hart's three lectures in Law, Liberty and Morality led me to ponder how morals influence law. Aside from these, I regularly read The Economist and The Week to keep me updated with global political affairs. I can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven things you've mentioned in one paragraph that you've read. Right. But am I sure you've read them? Because I could probably have figured, got as much detail in my answer by reading the what's written on the back of these books. You haven't told me anything about what's in the books. You've just told me they're full of law, which I could have guessed. You told me a tiny bit about how they made, how it got you to be interested. But if you say to me, I'm interested in the law of contract, I'll say, are you? And you'll say, yes. No, no, you have, to, you have to show me. You have to tell me something interesting about contracts and show your, show your engagement with it. We've got this thing about British and American law, which always annoys me. Please don't do it. Um, you've said, ah, oh, the sheer importance of law in a democratic society. How important can it be? You've given it half a sentence. Oh, it's really important. How important? Seven words. Again, these are bigger themes, bigger topics than you are. So give them the time and the space they deserve. This is also a reason not to put too many books or citations in your personal statement. You haven't got space to take any to take them all seriously. If you do, I would say cap out at three, maybe four. In my experience, one of the easiest ways to improve your personal statement is take out one of the books that you're talking about and to give each one of the others a little bit more space. Don't try and do seven in one paragraph. Just, just down. That takes on to step six. Um, I appreciate this is running a little long, everyone, but, but um, that's what you actually don't have to pay for. Oh, disconcerting. Um, what about things you're doing outside of the classroom? Um, the first thing to say is, don't tell me about titles and awards and things to do with your school. It's, it's great that you are the senior vice president of debating or the deputy vice captain of netball or the sub under head boy lieutenant or any of these things. That's all great. Um, but I'm not that impressed. It's great that you have titles, but I want to know what you learn from it. You know, you're not going to walk, you wouldn't walk into a job interview and be like, well, I was head boy and that taught me leadership skills. I'd be like, great. More, please. You, I, I want to hear some kind of evidence, some kind of story, some kind of something that you've taken away from these experiences rather than listing them. It's great that you've got a big old list of awards, but you're always running into the, into the risk that you'll end up looking like one of those old communist generals with enormous selection of medals and no one knows what they're for. 
Um, you want to avoid name dropping. If you went to a good school and you had lots of great opportunities, that's brilliant, but I would underplay that. Um, if you've had the opportunity to be an intern to the prime minister, if you've met um, the president a bunch of times, if your uncle is uh, the best judge in America, you know, any of these things, that's all great. But because other students aren't going to have had those opportunities, they can't be used as, as a way of making a fair comparison between you and the other students. If you are like, you know, let's just say if you are Joe Biden's son, no one else applying is. So you can't really use that as a way of showing off. It's great. I'm sure it's very interesting. Tell me about why it's interesting. Tell me about how, what you've learned from it. Don't use it as a way of showing off. Don't name drop it. Just it doesn't look good. Um, and because other students aren't going to be able to do it, it isn't a useful way of making a comparison about that isn't a good way of showing how much how capable you are, because it just doesn't compare. And so if you can't make a good link between the thing you've achieved outside the classroom and what, how it makes you suitable for the subject, just just don't bother with it. I know this can be hard because you're proud of these achievements. But pride alone isn't enough to justify putting them in. So we look at an example. Um, here's a sporty person. Uh, they write, outside of my studies, I have many interests, with tennis being my favourite sport. I'm also a keen golfer, rugby player and cricketer. I find endurance events to be a good test of my self-will. So I often compete in biathlons and run a 20-mile race for charity. That's nice. Um, so what I've learned is that you're very fit. Now, presumably, you're not applying to study running um, or golf. So all that's very nice, but it hasn't convinced me to take you. The bit about the biathlons for charity, that might be interesting. You haven't told me anything about them. You told me that they require self, they require determination, which was obvious. Um, I, I don't need telling that it's not fun running a marathon and that you have to have like determination to do it. I can like look at a marathon and be like, oh, I don't fancy that. That looks like it's really hard. You're not telling me anything new. Now the charity, that might be interesting. You might have, there might be something that you're particularly passionate about, about the cause, about the experiences you've had related to it. There might be something interesting there, but you haven't told me anything about it. All you've told me is how sporty you are, which I don't care about. So what you want to do is draw a link between the things you're doing outside the classroom and the, um, the reasons that I, I want to take you on at the university. I'm just going to pause for water here. Um, I'll tell you what, Sophie, would you like to do some reading? Will you, will you read this one out for me? I was muted there. Also, um, will, you, will you do a quick reading while I rest my voice? <laughs> a quick, uh, yes, you, yeah, you have been working hard. Um, so music has coloured my historical studies. For example, I played various. Oh dear, help me with this. <laughs> uh, this is a Shostakovich. Thank you very much. Symphonies coinciding with my studies of Star Stalinist Russia at GCSE, each with a very different feel depending on his relationship with Stalin. But perhaps most moving was the play was playing his 10th symphony, a purely self-indulgent expression of relief after the death of the dictator. It's, an impo it's impossible to appreciate this great work without its without its historical context, which transforms the piece into something personal, attaching the listener emotionally. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, so um, the backstory here, which, you know, if you were if you were a historian, you would know, not you personally, so, um, is that Shostakovich <laughs> was um, at various times uh, required by the Soviet government to produce pieces of patriotic music. Um, and his relationship with Stalin was difficult because uh, Stalin, a difficult man, um, and given Stalin's record with people who he didn't necessarily get on with, which was to send them to Siberia to die, um, Shostakovich was quite pleased when Stalin died because, you know, who wouldn't, well, actually, I would quite fancy going to Siberia right now because it's cold, apparently. Um, but what you see here is that the student has drawn together the work they've been doing in music and they have tied it up with the subject they're applying for, which in this instance is history. 
They're telling me about how the music has informed their historical interests, how it has enriched their understanding of, um, of Soviet history, how it has given and how it, the combination of their musical practice and their historical research has come together to create something that couldn't have happened without both. Now, what they could have done here is they could have said, I have grade eight cello, which would be nice. Maybe they do. I can't remember what it says in the rest of the personal statement. But what I've learned from this is much more interesting than that. I've learned that they are using that musical ability, their sensitivity, their interest in history, to put the music together with something else to create something more. What they've got here is insight into Shostakovich that I will not be able to have because I cannot play the cello. Not at all. Not even grade one. Not even grade zero. Is there a grade zero? This is telling me something interesting about the applicant that is new and different and that I can get it and I can be, be impressed by. Whereas just the raw qualification alone doesn't do any of that. Step seven, only two to go. Um, final lines of your personal statement. These are the hardest part. Um, if you don't want to add a new idea now, you're running out of space. You've probably only got two or three sentences worth of space left. Um, don't don't introduce a new idea now. Students love doing this. Sometimes you will get to the end of the personal statement and the most interesting thing in it will be at the very end. And there won't be time to develop it. And you go, oh no, why didn't you put that at the beginning? That was interesting. Sometimes, and this is an interesting thing that I've spotted, sometimes they finally get round to writing the introduction at the end. Sometimes the last couple of sentences you've written are actually the best sentences to put at the beginning. Um, what you want to do here, you want to nice and tidily restate the theme of your personal statement. You want to say, I am super interested in chemistry because of um, my fascination with the inner workings of the cell and the potential for life altering drugs based on blah, 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 something like that. Don't tell me which university you're applying for. You're applying for five, four in the case of medicine, well, four plus one. And you don't want to offend the other universities. It's a small thing, but they might be upset. Um, and you want to make sure these sentences are actually doing something. It's really easy to kind of write nothing at the end. If that happens, just chop them off and use those, those, those words somewhere else. If you haven't got anything interesting to say, it's kind of okay to end abruptly. Um, much better to have more interesting ideas in the rest of the statement than to spend a really long time getting to a kind of labored conclusion that isn't very interesting. Um, we can look at a bad one. Uh, this is a case of flattery. Um, I believe that I have the determination and aptitude to study economics at a degree level, and it would be an honor to be offered a place at your world-renowned university. All right. But well, what, what am I learning here? I'm imagining I'm the, I'm the, the admissions tutor. Uh, they believe they have the determination to study economics at degree level. Well, that's good because that's what they're doing. Um, I'm glad they believe in themselves as part of this application. Not crazy interesting, but it, you know, it's nice. Um, it would be an honor to be offered a place at my world-renowned university. Oh, thank you. Oh, 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 I'm really, oh, oh, I didn't, oh, I didn't know it was world-renowned. Oh, and you're saying I'm pretty and nice hair. Oh, and you like my beard? Goodness me. No. It's, it's not going to work. I'm, I'm not impressed. I know it's a good university. You don't need to tell me. This sentence hasn't done anything. It might have annoyed me a tiny bit, but there's a bunch of other stuff you could have done with that base. You could have had another insight into one of the books you've talked about. You could have expanded on a little bit of a personal story. There's a bunch of stuff you could have done that would have been more interesting than telling me the university you go to is good. I would like to go to it. And also, I'm applying for economics. I know you're applying for economics. It says so on the form. You don't need to tell me that again. Here's a good one. With a genuine zeal for the subject and an ability to relate my studies to the real world, I'm convinced that I will thoroughly thrive at degree level economics. Here are some things I like about it. One, it's short. It could be shorter, um, but it's short. It doesn't introduce any new ideas. It just says, I think I'll be good at this. And it doesn't... It doesn't do anything weird. It doesn't. It doesn't beg for the place. It doesn't show off. 
it has a nice level of modesty to it. Um, it's okay. But again, the last sentence, don't sweat it too much. This one I like well enough, but it's not the most important thing. It's just the hardest. That brings us to um, step eight. I promised you eight steps. There have been nine. Um, this is where the things get really tricky. I said that the last sentence was the hardest bit. I was lying. Actually, the hardest bit is editing the personal statement. I'd say the first step, write a version of your personal statement. Hopefully you've already done one by now, but if you haven't, this weekend, do one. Um, it doesn't need to be good. If anything, you want to start with something bad because you'll be able to build confidence by improving on it. Um, don't try and do a new draft every day between now and the UCAS deadline. You'll go mad and you won't actually improve it because you won't be able to see what you're doing. You'll be so close to the text. You'll be so... Argh, you, won't, you won't be able to see it. You want to take a break between each version, maybe, maybe three or four days, maybe even a week. You kind of want to forget what you've written as much as you can so that you can then come and look at it, pretend it was written by someone else and critique it and improve it that way. You want to think about who you who is going to be reading it. And that's kind of the approach I've tried to take here today. Who will read my personal statement? What are they going to think about it? Are they going to feel patronized? Are they going to be interested? Am I stating the obvious? All of these things, pretend that you are the person making the decision. Sometimes this is a good opportunity to swap with friends or to ask teachers or someone else to look at it. But it's a useful and mental exercise to do for yourself as well. You know, spend a couple of minutes psyching yourself up imagining you are the person you could put on like a little suit or something you could print it out you could do like a face and be like mm, mm, what's this person written here have fun with it but try and read it as if someone else had written it you want to make sure the tone of voice you've got is right you don't want to seem patronizing you don't want to seem like you're showing off you want to strike a nice balance again this is someone where it's helpful to talk to other people to get a sense of it. You can also read it out loud. You'll be able to tell if you sound like you're showing off. You'll be able to tell if your sentences are too long. You know, even though the person reading it probably won't be reading it aloud, when we read, we kind of read things aloud to ourselves in our heads. So see if it sounds okay coming out of your mouth as well as on the page. Also remember, the important part of the personal statement is the bit in the middle. The bit in the middle with the books you've read, the examples, the ideas you've had, all of that matters much more than the little bit at the beginning where you say you want what subject you want to study, or the bit at the end where you say what subject you want to study again. If you're running out of space, cut out, cut down on the bits at the top and the bottom and give yourself more space in the middle. You also want to make sure you're doing your editing right. Remember, you've got 4,000 characters. That includes the spaces, it includes the commas, it includes the exclamation marks. You can't use bold, you can't use italics, you can't underline. So, you know, don't rely on that. Uh, don't spend 100 years moving around your commas. You're not going to improve your statement very much at that point. Focus on getting the ideas you want in there and then kind of leaving it alone, tidying it up. You don't want to spend 100 years in your personal statement. Once you've got it good, the improvements you can make are going to be fairly small. Um, and as I say, if you're a little bit too long, Try chopping off your first sentence and your last sentence. Um, what I find in my writing is that often when I start a piece of writing, the first few sentences, first few paragraphs, maybe even the first page, it kind of doesn't count. It's just me warming up. And that once I'm three pages in, often I can give the whole of the first page and it still makes sense. The first page was just me warming my brain up, figuring out what I was doing, and all the interesting stuff comes later. Maybe you might find, even find it easier to write the introduction last. That's something I've always found helpful for myself. But it is always interesting to check. Is the bit at the beginning really the start? Or is it just the bit where you are, you know, imagine you were in a, a Formula One race. I think that happens tomorrow, doesn't it? You know, the beginning of the race isn't the bit where they drive round and round to warm up the tyres. It's the bit where they actually start the race. Have you started at the beginning of the race? Or have you started with the bit where you warm up the tyres? You know, is the beginning of your writing the bit you want to start with, or is it just this extra little bit you were doing to kind of remember how to write things down? Cool. Um, is there any slides we've got? Um, and then there's the rest of the UCAS form. Um, 
if something is elsewhere on your UCAS form, don't put it in the personal statement. Don't tell me what A-levels you're studying. Don't tell me what school you go to. Don't tell me your name or your age. You don't need to put any of that stuff in because it's somewhere else on the form. When the person is reading your UCAS form, I know this from experience of having done them, what it will be like is they will have the personal statement in one hand, and in their other hand, they will have the bit that tells them who you are. The way this normally comes is the bit that tells them who you are will be stapled onto the front, and then they read the personal statement on the next page. As they're reading the personal statement, they'll look and go, ah, oh, this is this is Sophie's personal statement. And she's doing these levels all right. Don't tell me stuff twice. Um, make sure your school knows what you're applying for and is supportive of what you're you're going for. I know that schools can be difficult. Um, for one of the reasons I don't go to them anymore, uh, also because I'm too old. Um, but make sure that you've spoken to them and they're supportive and that they know what's going on. This is a particularly important part of the reference. Make sure that you have a good relationship with the teacher who's going to do it. Make sure you are, hopefully you asked them before the end of term last year. If not, ask them nice and early on and make sure that you know what they need from you and how you can make their life easy. A lot of schools, there will be one, maybe two people who do all the UCAS stuff. Um, it's a lot of stuff. Um, I, can, I can tell you that from experience. It is for about six months, a full-time job, but because it's not a full-time job for the rest of the year, a lot of schools won't have someone whose full-time job it is. And so if you want to get, if you want to get the results you want, if you want to have a nice, pleasant experience with putting your statement together, make their life easier. Find out what it is that they need, when they need it, make sure that you've done it on time. Let other students be the difficult ones. Figure out what they want and how you can support them. It'll make everyone's life much easier. And the last and most practical thing is, I believe you can register for, I think you can probably register now. Um, so I'm sure we'll be in the Q&A. Um, I believe you can sign up to UCAS and start filling in the form right now. Go and do that today. Um, fill out all of that before you start on the personal statement. Probably between now and the middle of October, your name isn't going to change, your age isn't going to change, where you isn't going to change, your A-levels aren't going to change. Most of the stuff that goes into the form isn't going to change. So you may as well do it now, nice and early, so you don't have to worry about it later. Because the last thing you want is to be in a position where you have not filled out the rest of the form and you've got an hour to go and you're desperately trying to remember what you do, where your GCSE certificates are. Worry about that now. Don't worry about it in two months' time when you're running out of time. Um, it also, and I recommend this, maybe this just works for me, it gives you a real sense of achievement because what you can do is you can fill out 90% of the UCAS form all in one go. But you can go, brilliant, I've nearly finished. Now you've all only done the easy bit, but it feels very satisfying you've done all of it. It looks really nice, you get lots of green ticks. Um, maybe not you're, you're not as susceptible to the sort of thing as I am, but for me it was very satisfying. It was my favourite part of the UCAS process, actually. It was the bit that went really well. Um, so, core cool, blimey, nearly an hour today. I shouldn't have put so many I, sh I shouldn't have agreed to do eight steps. I should have said six. Um, so, um, I've talked a lot today uh, about personal statements, how to do them good. Um, but there is more to the application process. Um, and there's a lot more we can do to help uh, than just this presentation. Although I'd say this is a pretty good presentation. Um, and so Sophie um, is going to talk to you about that for a little while while I rest my voice. Sophie, tell us about the support that we offer. Well, don't tell me. I already know. Tell, tell everyone else. <laughs> You're going to give me the slides, aren't you, Matt? <laughs> Absolutely. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So... Yes, we. Uh, I'm Sophie and I'm an admissions consultant um, here at Uni Admissions. That was amazing, Matt, by the way. That was um, so informative. I'm sure you've really helped a lot of people today just get a clearer idea. Um, so oh, our programmes... Um, um, before, yes. before I get... Sorry, before I go, because I can see, I can see the, I can see the live attendance. Um, yes. We are going to do some Q&A after this. So do stick around, uh, because otherwise I won't be able to A your cues. Carry on, Sophie. So our program consists of four main components. I'm hoping that Matt is going to choose the um, personal tutoring to start off with. So <clears throat> we have. I'm, uh, I'm hoping so too. 
Yes. <laughs> expert bespoke tuition on the areas that you most need it. So um, these tutors have uh, gone through the process that you are going through so they know exactly what you're going through and they can support you um, and they are handpicked for you. Um, they can, they will also help to prepare you with whatever you need really but interview process um, with a panel of um, subject specialist in addition to your lead tutor so you'll get different uh, tutors to uh, practice with which is much more like the real life situation um, so yeah and also these tutors they are um, from all over the world and um, they've all scored in the top 10 percent of their admissions test uh, internationally or nationally sorry <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. Either way, they're very good. Either way, they're very, very good. Yeah, yeah. Moving on. Um, the second, the second part <laughs> of our program is our resources. So we have published over a hundred books at this point, and you will have full access to our library um, of. Uh, of these um, books and videos and um, other resources that are there to support you and to um, uh, supplement the work that you're doing with your tutor, hundreds of questions for admissions tests and um, access to our prep portal, which is where everything is held and um, gives you a chance to uh, practice in those exam conditions, which is all important, especially when those exams are um, put under time pressure. So to really um, get feeling really, really comfortable with that so that when you go and do the real thing, it feels like, oh, OK, it's uh, like a walk in the park <laughs> is what we're hoping. Maybe not quite a walk in the park, but um, certainly a lot easier than if you don't have that opportunity to practice. And um, thirdly, we have our enrichment seminars, which are every week at 2 p.m. Um, currently, that would be 2 p.m. BST, but it will change, I guess, to GMT when we go into um, uh, sunlight, um, what is it, daylight savings. <laughs> um, so weekly seminars uh, that are held at a deep at university level so basically they are there to help you stretch you outside of the confines of your a level um, uh, experience so that you get a much more deep understanding of actually what they're gonna expect of you when you go to the interview um, debate argue all of that kind of thing um, and uh, yeah, help to prepare you for the hurdles that are coming up. And then lastly, there are the day courses, our intensive day courses. So we have admissions test uh, courses and interview day courses. So these are placed right where they need to be which is just before that particular hurdle whether it's the test or the interview so that you can really really focus on what you need to at that point so everything goes in steps like Matt was saying focus on the on on your um, application now and then um, yeah when you need it these courses are going to be there to get you where you need to be for those big big hurdles um, yeah Thanks, thanks, Sophie. Okay, um, you're welcome. Uh, the good news is it does all seem to work. Um, we have results that we're really proud of that have been really consistent, even over, um, even with added competition over the past few years. Um, we're hoping to get our 500th offer as an as an organisation this year. Um, hopefully, we'll get there. I think it'll be. I would have to look at the totalizer. Obviously, we won't know until the new year. Um, and our success rates compare really flatteringly um, with some of the fanciest and most expensive schools in the country. Uh, sadly, we don't have the snazzy outfits of an Eton or a Westminster, um, but we do have similarily good results. Although I think I would look very fetching in one of those little hats that they wear. Is it Eton with the hats? I think you one of them has would. hats, doesn't it? 
Yeah, what, one of these posh schools has hats. I can't remember which one. Um, if you've enjoyed this webinar, um, please write something nice about it on Trustpilot. Um, I've been asking for some months now for people to write something nice about me on Trustpilot. And I have promised whoever does it first will get their review put in all of these presentations. No one has yet done it, so it could be you. And what a, what a selling point that is. Um, <laughs> extra points for people who say how good looking I am, uh, how funny, how clever, how charming, uh, how tall, uh, slim. Uh, this is not else? what you want to be muscular. putting in your personal statement, I'm, I'm thinking. Oh, <laughs> this that, is what yeah, not to good, put in your personal statement. Absolutely. I want, I want the things that are the absolute opposite. I just want relentless flattery um, in your personal statement. You probably shouldn't tell them how handsome you are. Um, <laughs> yeah. Even if you are very, very handsome. Um, <laughs> speaking of very, very handsome, uh, you can also listen to um, our founder, Rohan, and my colleague, Will's podcast. Uh, both very handsome, particularly Will, um, which will fill you in um, a very similar format to this, but a little bit more fun without any slides. Um, they've dealt with everything from interview anxiety to the zombie apocalypse. Um, so they really are covering the, the gamut from, from A to Z there. Um, what we'll do now is we'll take some questions. I will, let's do questions for about 10 or 15 minutes. And then I'm going to go and have a shower to steam my voice because <laughs> this is getting very tired in this very dry room. Um, so I'm going to start with some of the easy ones and we'll sort of go from there. So Matt, I need to go. Background. I've got a call. So just sorry to, oh, to leave you. But... No, that's quite all right. Goodbye, Sophie. Thank have you. a lovely Bye. day. Enjoy your call. Um, in the background, you can see a little animation um, showing how to get in touch with us. As Sophie just mentioned, she is now on a call. That person on the call could be you. Um, all you have to do is visit the website, fill in your details, and we will get in touch and arrange a conversation. They're completely free of charge, commitment free. It's a chance for us to get to know you, figure out how we can help and move forward from there. So let's try some easy questions. Um, Sudhir asked uh, whether there is a recording of the webinar. There is. Um, they normally come out on a Wednesday or a Thursday. Um, if you visit the Uni Admissions website, you will see that there are loads. You can go back and watch dozens and dozens of these, listen to hours and hours of my voice. I do not recommend it, um, but they are all there if you would like to have a look. And this week's one will arrive sometime um, around Wednesday or Thursday once it's been edited down to take out all the awkward pauses and the bit at the beginning where I'm getting things ready. Uh, Maria asks about the most overly used books for your subject. Um, so, when you are trying to figure out what someone lazy would do, um, often the easiest way is to try and do it. Um, so, if you're trying to figure out what the most obvious books for your subject are, imagine what someone who wasn't trying very hard would do. So I would say type in, uh, let's say, chemistry personal statement. I'm going to do it live on Google for you now. And it says, aha, perfect. The first result is... Uh, chemistry personal statement examples. So I would say, look at a couple of those, see what books they're reading. Don't necessarily pick those books. Maybe read them anyway, but don't make them the centerpiece of your personal statement. Have a look around. Google is the easiest place to start. Have a look at the examples that are available online. See what people are reading that's sort of popping up, obviously, um, and go from there. As I said earlier, you need reading a book, ideally, that some, no one else has read so that you can have something new and interesting to say about it. Um, Jane asks about work experience. Um, it really depends on the work experience that you've had. Um, if the work experience you've had is really interesting, if it forms a big part of your motivation to study the subject, um, then absolutely, you can even make it the centerpiece of your personal statement. Um, if you've done something that has really ignited your passion, that you've done some, that you've achieved something in, um, that has um, really had a big impact on you, make it the most important thing in your personal statement. If you spend two weeks making coffee and photocopies, probably don't make that a piece of your personal statement. Um, everything that goes into the personal statement is there for the purpose of showing what an interested, passionate, capable student you are. If the work experience shows that, if you can talk about it in a way that's interesting and engaging, then make it a big deal. If it wasn't interesting and engaging, and if it was 
boring, um, don't make it be delivering a personal statement. It's also worth noting here with work experience. One of the reasons to do work experience is to find out if you like a particular job. Um, I know plenty of people who have gone off to study law only to discover they don't actually want to be lawyers. I've known people who have studied medicine only to discover that they don't want to be doctors or they fight faint at the sight of blood. If your work experience is bad, if you don't enjoy it, that isn't necessarily a problem. If what you've learned from it is you don't want to be an accountant, then that's brilliant. You've probably saved yourself several years of your life. Work experience doesn't have to be good to be useful, but if you're making it the centerpiece of your personal statement, it should be. Um, talking about practical work after graduating, yeah, again, if that's the big motivation for you, if you really want to go off and do something that puts your degree into practice and that's why you're doing it, if your motivation for the degree is to get to the next thing, then that's brilliant. Um, if you're studying law because you want to become a barrister, if you're studying um, medicine because you want to become a psychiatrist, studying chemistry um, because you want to become a pharmacist, putting the reason why you're doing it in there is good because it's going to make the whole motivation of the personal statement much clearer. Um, Ibrahim asks about submitting your application early. Um, if it's finished, if you've done the personal statement, if you've filled out all the boxes, there is absolutely nothing wrong with sending it in early. Um, it gives you a little bit of a break. You don't have to worry about it anymore. Um, you can spend time on preparing for admissions tests. You could go on holiday. If you're finished, then there's absolutely nothing wrong with sending it off now. If you think you're going to have second thoughts, you're going to want to check it again later, then you can delay it a bit. But if you are finished, don't wait until the night before just for the sake of it. It's much more, you will find it much more mentally satisfying, much more relaxing to have done it. And for it to be over, um, it will also help you focus on the next thing. I found in my life, and I think other people um, in their lives, if you have something that you haven't quite finished, that you have to finish before you get to the next thing, it kind of makes the next thing harder to get to, harder to focus on. So if you are delaying studying for your admissions test because you're worrying about your personal statement, if you're done with the personal statement, send it off. It's probably fine. Personal statements, you're not gonna make, you're not gonna make or break your application by shuffling around the commas, but you can make or break your application by not doing any other preparation for interview or, um, admissions test because you spent all of your time changing your adjectives around. Um, uh, Kausar asked about NEA. Um, I don't know what NEA is. What is NEA? Is this like an, is this like a, buh, 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 buh. oh, here we go. I've looked it up. Apparently it's some kind of large project. Um, that sounds good. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, talk, talk about it. You can mention it's part of your NEA. I mean, that's only three characters, if you like. Um, but, you know, if you could introduce it and just say, while working on this problem, you don't necessarily need to say it was part of your coursework. Um, as long as you found it interesting, as long as it demonstrates your motivation, that's fine. Um, you know, I wouldn't say, while I was doing my maths A-level, because it says maths A-level on the other side of the page, on the side of the page, um, but, you know, it's not going to, it's not a huge problem either way. Um, let's have a look at some other questions. Um, Arpan asks about uh, writing personal statements for more scientific subjects, um, such as physics. Uh, so physics is a good example because there are a couple of really um, clear and helpful books that you can read. Um, so if you were going for physics, then I would definitely say read Brief History of Time, uh, read, uh, What's the what's the what's the Richard Feynman book called? Um, it has a funny name, um, it's like "Goodness Me, Mr. Feynman" or something like that. Surely you're joking, Mr. Feynman is the name of the um, is the book. Um, read those books. Move on from there as to how into the next thing you're interested in. You may not have to do the necessarily the same level of reading um, for physics or for chemistry or for maths, but Remember that the kinds of problems that you're going to encounter um, as you advance in these subjects 
are going to be much more expressed in language, are going to be much more complicated. You know, they're potentially going to be used for problems that aren't straightforwardly solved. Um, and so engaging with these things in a narrative setting is um, is really helpful. Um, I'd also look, so if there's a good biography of Euler you can read, perhaps, really get into the um, sort of the personality of the subject a little bit, because, of course, you want to be a personality in there as well. Um, uh, Aisha asks about um, applying for different subjects. Uh, so say PPE and then international relations somewhere else. Um, so this is one of those areas where you don't actually have to worry too much. Um, the universities will have seen this before. A lot of people apply for PPE at Oxford and politics at UCL or international relations at LSE. They will read your personal statement and they will know what is going on. Um, they will be used to it. Don't worry about it. Write a really good personal statement for your first choice. And don't worry too much about whether it's going to be applicable. As long as it's broadly covering the same kind of ideas, it isn't going to be a problem that you haven't perfectly tailored it. Um, now, if you're applying for history in one place and maths in another place, you're going to have problems. But hopefully you're not doing that. Um, as long as the subjects are close together, the universities will have seen this before and it won't be a problem. Um, you're not the first person to, to go for that combination. In fact, there will probably be a couple of hundred other people. So the universities will not be surprised and they won't be confused. Um, And I'm just going to look. Um, uh, Suhani asked about PPE and having uh, books for each of the sections. I would say you want to try and tie them together. Um, PPE is one of those interesting degrees where the three areas are quite mixed up. Um, so, you know, pick out a philosophical text, but think about the little implications of it. We talked about Plato earlier. That's a great example. You know, Plato isn't interested in democracy. He thinks it's a bad idea. Um, if you're talking about the economics of it, think about how the how economics impacts on philosophy. Think about how um, what the political implications of that economic set of, set of economic ideas might be. Think about the economic implications of Plato's system. You know, if you have no democracy, if you have one guy in charge, the philosopher king, I guess he's in charge of the economy, right? Can can one person plan an economy? Would that work? You know, tie tie your ideas together. Don't think of it as applying for three separate subjects. Um, and uh, AJ asked about rereading the book. Hopefully you will have time uh, to read the book. Um, again, uh, if it's a long book, uh, then yeah, stick to the chapter that you, you've mentioned. Um, but you may be, in the interview, it's not unusual for them to ask you what you've been reading. And so it's always a good idea to have a real answer. Um, and I'm just going to take a couple more. Laura asks about um, applying for joint honours courses. Um, I, again, I wouldn't worry too much. As long as your um, topics are, are fairly well linked together, um, you should be okay. If you're applying for one with a language option as well, um, then I, I wouldn't be too worried about making the, the language point um, too large. You can put it in there if you want, but I don't think it'll be the end of the world um, if you don't. The, again, the universities have a, they don't know where else you've applied, but they will have a sense based on your personal statement of what's going on. And so you're not going to be discriminated against for having um, a slightly confusing personal statement if they can understand me. And we're just going to take one uh, final question. Just look at what is. Um, and uh, Benjamin asks about the recording. Uh, I mentioned that a moment ago, but yes, that'll be on the website later in the week. Um, and Kushi asks about having a uh, introduction and a conclusion. Um, I think it's nice if you can manage it, um, but if you find that you can't figure out a way to lead into it nicely to finish it off nicely. It isn't the most important thing. The most important thing is that you're demonstrating why you're interested in the subject, that you've put time and effort into researching it, that you can show that actually it would be a good idea for you to study it at an academic level, that you're committed to the, um, the area of study. So if you can't tie it all up in a perfectly neat bow, it's not the end of the world. Um, it's nice, 
But if you find that it ends a little bit abruptly or that it starts a little awkwardly, again, it's not the end of the world. If you use the rest of that space to really show how interested and engaged you are by the subject, then you'll be fine. Um, I'm going to call it a day there because my voice is absolutely dying. Um, and we've been running for well over an hour now. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for joining me. It's been really fun to talk about personal statements. As you can probably tell from the level of detail, these are this more or less my favorite part of the whole process. I think they're a really interesting thing to talk about, a really interesting thing to write. And most of all, they're an interesting thing to read um, because they are this fascinating mix of learning a lot about a person and also seeing how that person fights with a really difficult uh, literary task, so to speak. Um, I will um, see you all in um, a week's time, hopefully, when we'll be talking about extracurricular activities. Um, <laughs> thank you very much, Asia. And um, uh, have a lovely weekend until then. Um, depending on where you are in the world, uh, if you're in the Northern Hemisphere, try and stay cool. And I've no idea what's going on in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, and I guess, I'm trying to think, if you're in the bit of the world where it's raining at the moment, um, enjoy that as well. Um, I don't believe that's due in East Asia for another couple of weeks, but you never know, um, depending on where you are. Anyway, thank you very much for your time, and um, I will see you all next time. Have a lovely weekend, and goodbye.